Wisdom. Prudentia. Justice. Justicia. Temperance. Temperantia. Courage. Fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Hi, Steve here with the Sunday Stoic Podcast. My guest this week, oh, let's do this again. Howdy, Steve here with the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Remember, you can support the show by going to www.patreon.com slash Sunday Stoic for ad-free episodes and other rewards like a challenge coin or a chance to chat with me and other patrons to learn about this great philosophy. My guest this week is Michael Tremblay. This is his second time on the show, so if you want to go back to the archives, you can uh, hear his first interview. But Michael is a PhD student at Queen's University, where he is working on his thesis. His thesis is titled Theory and Training in Epictetus's Program of Moral Education. He also has a bachelor's and master's degree in philosophy from Carleton University, and he is an accomplished uh, practitioner of uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and a wrestler. And so uh, I hope you'll enjoy this episode. We're going to talk about an article that he wrote for Modern Stoicism. There'll be a link to that in the show description. Um, I thought it was a really powerful article because he talks about how the dichotomy of control is often misapplied by practicing Stoics. And so I think it's uh, something that it's the foundation. It's one of the fundamental things we talk about in this philosophy. And so if there's some way that we've been misinterpreting it, I think it's very important that we establish that and uh, get a correct view of what we typically call the dichotomy of control. Michael Tremblay, welcome to the Sunday Stoic podcast for the second time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be back. Yeah, how how are things going with your uh, PhD studies? Uh, it's good. So uh, yeah, I'm writing my dissertation on Epictetus and uh, his kind of program of moral education. So I'm finishing that up and I'm looking to defend in the next couple months and applying to jobs and hopefully, um, you know, teaching somewhere or moving to a, a different school to continue researching next year. Oh, that's exciting. So so defense in a few months. So are you are you uh, are you approaching that with stoic a stoic attitude like I got this or or it, we can talk about that later I guess the the dichotomy of control versus uh versus what's in our power to influence and things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Anything stressful works well on that. I mean for the defense I'm just thinking of it. So I don't for those that don't know when you finish your PhD um, I mean, I haven't done it yet. You would have a better idea, but um, you basically go in and defend this work in a room full of, you know, really smart people and experts in the subject. And if you, you know, if, if they like it, um, you pass and you, you get your degree if it reaches a certain level of standard. Um, but for me, I'm kind of looking at it like a great opportunity because you do this research, especially academic research, it's not always accessible. It's not always um, read by a lot of people. So more just looking at it as an opportunity to just discuss stoicism for three hours in a room of people that have to be interested in it and talk yeah. about it. So do you do a uh, public presentation before the defense? Uh, not to my, not to my knowledge. Um, I know some people do that. I think, um, but I think we might just dig into it. Okay, great. Well, um, the reason I brought you on is I thought about talking ab- about a paper that you recently authored, or, an, or a blog post, essentially, that you recently authored. Uh, but I thought, wow, I might be able to actually just get the author to talk about it instead of me uh, just interpreting what you wrote. Um, and the the piece appeared in uh, on the Modern Stoicism blog. It's called, What Many People Misunderstand About the Stoic Dichotomy of Control. And I thought it was it was just really interesting because I think I've you mentioned that even yourself may when you try to deep dive into stoicism, if you're thinking about it the wrong way, it can lead to confusion. And I think I have felt like a failure and been a little confused when maybe I'm actually thinking about the dichotomy of control uh, in, in, in a way that maybe doesn't reflect what the stoics meant when I mean, they never use that phrase for one, but when they when they talked about what we call the dichotomy of control. So first of all, you mentioned that it's 
the the dichotomy of control is kind of a gateway for a lot of people and and for some it's as far as they go into into stoic philosophy do you want to comment on that a little bit yeah so the dichotomy of control really simply as it's presented is this idea that there's two types of things in the world there's the things that you control and the things that you don't control or at least that's how it's sometimes represented and you know stoicism just provides this insight it's really simple insight that you should focus on the things that are up to you um both because you know that's going to be more effective so there's almost like a there's a effectiveness reason like that's the stuff that you can actually change and help and then there's a psychological or emotional reason which is that most of your distress and frustration is going to come from either focusing on things that you can't control or um confusing things treating things that aren't up to you like how someone else thinks about you mm-hmm. like it is up to you sure. and then thinking that it's, it's it's somehow your fault if they have this perception not like they're their own person um coming up to that um so th- I kind of look at stoicism there's kind of a couple of different levels to it and on a first level there's kind of this this life hack level and some people I know some people can criticize that but I think that's I think that's great depending on the level you're trying to approach it in if you read a bit about stoicism and, and you walk away and you keep your value system but you pick up some things that help your life that's great that's like a, I think that's a successful engagement with philosophy and so the dichotomy of control is really popular on that life hack level it's something you could explain in 10 minutes and it helps, and it's something that's also applicable. It's to be applied constantly. And it also graphs on, I think importantly, onto any kind of value system or many value systems, if you don't look at it deeper. Um, It's just something, no matter what you're attached to, you know, even if you're attached for the pursuit of money, you know, you see this thing of like entrepreneurs, which is like not very stoic to be obsessed about getting money, but they're like, oh, I can make money more effectively if I focus on what's up to me and what I have control over. So it's this thing that can graph on to kind of any value system. Um, and I think in a way that's great, but I think because it's, it exists and it's very popular in that kind of life hack domain, when you dive deeper into stoicism, you get some, some false impressions or some misrepresentations of what that theory means that can kind of hold you back or be more confusing as you try to dig in deeper. Yeah. You mentioned that, um, uh, yeah, you mentioned that when you dig deeper, it can cause confusion and, 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 the article and, and I have, I have run across that before and I have come up with my own interpretations of why, uh, that is, you know, my thought was, for example, uh, and we can get into this more in a moment, but, um, learning how to apply control, let's call it for, for now, um, is not so much an on off switch, but uh, like a dimmer switch, <laughs> you start with a little bit of skill and you're working on improving it. But sometimes you can feel like you're failing when, when you read it and you think I should be able to control my emotions now. Boom. I know, I know logically that it's, it's what makes sense logically. It, 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 is, it is what wisdom tells me that it should be possible. Therefore, I should be able to do it. But just knowing that something should be a, a certain way or, or is a way does not necessarily mean we have the skill set developed and the patterns and the habits to actually be an expert at it. Yeah. So, so building on that, what stoicism tells us we can control, or I was looking at Epictetus specifically because he's the one who really uses this the most, right. Um, at least in the, the writings that remain, because, you know, what's up to us um, is, you know, our judgments, um, the way we make use of impressions or the way we make use of, the information we receive about the world, you know, our emotions, our choice. Um, and so we're told that these are, you know, up to us or in our control, whatever definition you, or translation you want to use right now. And I think what, what you experience is a similar thing I experience is like, okay, I've learned that. I believe that, or at least I really want that to be true. Um, and I've also learned some stoicism, which tells me like, it shouldn't matter to me if this person insults me or it shouldn't matter to me if this thing doesn't go the way I want it to, but yet I'm still upset by it. And then you feel like, I you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. You feel somehow like you're a failure or somehow like you're failing stoicism or I, that, that can be if it's self-applied, which I did because I had a lot of faith in stoicism. And then I think you can push back and say, well, this is just stupid. This was just wrong then because clearly I don't control it. So you can either be upset with yourself or upset with the theory. Right. Um, but the point of the article is the point that that's just a, that's a misunderstanding um, of what it's trying to communicate and a lot of the, that tension comes 
from not really getting at what Epictetus was trying to say. Okay. So if do you, so first of all, we call it the dichotomy of control. Um, and you mentioned that it's not really about control at all. Uh, could you, so that's kind of be kind of a, a, a paradigm shift then for a lot of us who think of it that way. So what, how should we approach this, this idea? If it's not about control, what is it about? Yeah, so the main idea of the post was that um, there's just no word for control there, right? So control is being added in an English translation to try to graph on or make sense of the idea. And the argument is that it's kind of a bad way of making sense of the idea. Um, and I go into it further because when we think of control, we think of it in two main ways, which are either I can, um, I can immediately determine, you know, right now the way something is, or I can... Um, I think the other one I had there was like strongly influenced. Strongly influenced, yeah. Yeah, like you, and like neither... you, I, I, you, when you read like Bill Irvin's book, you know, he talks about mm -hmm. focusing on what you're part of what you can strongly influence, or you know, like when he mm -hmm. goes into his tricot, and we won't go down that road today. But yeah, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, it's it's the things you can influence right now that are theoretically purely yours to control, and the things that you have a heavy mm -hmm. influence on, like. Uh, you know, you can name, you know, playing, playing wrestling, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. giving it your, your best, your best shot. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how is it not? Uh, what, what is it if it's not control that, that the Stoics are advocating here? Yeah. So the, the, the Greek itself, um, I argue translates into like up to us, which is not very helpful, right? So it's the things up to us and that's not as catchy. Um, it's not as accessible. So then I try to dig into a bit and explain what up to us means and up does means, um, I argue, and I, I mean, I think this is the case, um, is that it's about causal, um, it's about causality. It's about the things that you cause. And in that sense, it's also about a kind of responsibility and not just a responsibility. We can think of I'm responsible for things that I immediately do, but the Stokes have kind of a grander sense of responsibility where you're responsible for things that are a result of you. Um, so the, the, the Stoic thing is there's, there's some things that you cause, there's some things that are a result of you. What are a result of you and your character it are the choices you make, the emotions you have, the way you make sense of information. That's a result of you. Um, things that are not a result of you are, you know, what other people think of, of you, your physical health, um, your, you know, the condition of your possessions. Mm -hmm. And so then we say, well, what does this mean? Causation, causality. And a way they try to flush it out is, um, and Epictetus talks about this. It's something that can be, if, 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 something can be externally restrained, prevented, um, influenced or not influenced, but like caused by something outside of you, then it's not up to you, right? So if I want to try my best, that's up to me. Whether or not I win is not up to me because that a very big part of that, my winning can be constrained by the injury. I'm using sport analogy because I wrestle, but it can, be, um, in, it can be constrained by the fact that I broke my leg a week ago Sure. constrained by the fact that the other person I'm, I'm wrestling against is, is much better than me. Um, so just this position of, of, of what you cause and what you're responsible for. And I don't know if we, if we want to st stick with that or go off on another tangent, but the innovation to that is that what you're responsible for is much different than what you have immediate control over, right? So you're responsible for the character or the results of your character, right? You caused your anger, your outbursts, um, your, your ignorance, but um, that's up to you in a sense. But that's not something you have immediate control over. That's something that's the culmination of a lifetime of habits and experiences and events. And that I, that I think is the, um, the most important clarification um, between control and something being up to you. So if I can try to do what I do in the classroom and analogize, uh, yeah, right. let's see if if i'm getting it or not this is why it's important to have uh have you on the show so i don't screw this up um <laughs> so um if i think of the things that are in my power let's say if we use that translation um the i like let's put it in the context of the stoic garden um we're trying to grow our good character or you know think of what the sage would look like his garden would be you know, his or her garden would be beautiful, right? And I, I'm starting with 
kind of a messed up looking garden here, <laughs> but it, <laughs> but I can't just make it beautiful overnight. I'm cultivating this over time. It's not in my mm. power to have the garden now, but I can be working towards the garden. Is that kind of a way to think about it, to cultivate these traits or these? It, I think that's great. And then, so the garden, right, is, is, is up, the quality of the garden is up to you. When we point, when we say, you know, who, why do you have a good garden or why do you have a bad garden? Uh, the store is going to say, well, it's, it's up to you. It's up to, up to the, the choices and the behaviors and the decisions you made as a gardener. Your character is a result of your choices, your decisions, um, your, your habits and your behaviors. Now, um, as you pointed out, right, if you have a bunch of weeds, you can't just snap your finger and those are gone. That's going to take time um, to clear those and to plant other types of things that will grow. Um, so being frustrated with yourself that like, well, I know I should be a good person. And I can't immediately do it. Or I know, you know, I shouldn't care what other people think, or I shouldn't get angry easily. and I can't immediately do it. There's no, there's no problem with that. The Stoics totally understand that the garden takes time to cultivate, but at the end of the day, it's, it's also your responsibility. Um, and it's, it's also a result of your choices. Um, and I think that's a, that's, for me, that was, that's a helpful realization in terms of not being as hard on myself as I progress as a stoic. And I always thought this was, I always thought this was the biggest thing missing from stoicism discussion is we have kind of stoicism for people who have never learned it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we talk about sages and there's like very little discussion or development of this kind of painful in between development process where we're, we're trying to become better people. Um, and I think that that understanding of, of um, you know, the dichotomy of control helps explain how, what that process is supposed to look like. Yeah, the Stoics sometimes say we're either virtuous or we're mm -hmm. vicious or, you know, we're, 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 we're one or the other. But, but I did read in Seneca the other day uh, um, where he talks about how at least when you start cultivating wisdom, life becomes bearable. So there's mm -hmm. some recognition there of this progress towards the goal even though you haven't arrived to your destination. And, and I like when we read about those analogies comparing life to a voyage mm -hmm. and things like that, because you don't arrive instantly. It's, it's a process. And, and mm -hmm. I think it's easy to forget that when you're judging yourself <laughs> and looking at yourself. Do you think journaling is a good way to, to, to see how your garden's doing, you know, to, to uh, you know, what do we do to ensure we're moving you know, we don't have a switch to, to be in control of our anger. You know, let's say we, we get angry easily. Um, what are some steps do you think that we could take that would, that would uh, fit this paradigm of, of the, I don't know what to call it other than the dichotomy of control for now. Uh, to, <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. <laughs> so, so one thing I look at in Epictetus is the actual exercises that he recommends um, and how he recommends people progress Journaling is, journaling is definitely one of them. I would say just in general, I don't know if mindfulness is the right term, but um, I would say, you know, beginning to recognize your thought processes and, and your, your habits and your dispositions. I was thinking of this in a medical analogy of kind of just like, um, you know, it's just an evaluation. So you're kind of looking like, where is the injury? Okay, it's in my ankle. Well, is it sprained or is it broken? Okay, well, it looks to be, I can't put weight on it. It looks to be broken. The first step I think, um, is just to figure out, you know, how your brain works, um, what kind of things tend to upset you, how your, your self-talk tends to work, non-judgmentally, just this kind of diagnosis process. And I don't personally journal, but I think journaling can be very helpful for that. Mm -hmm. I think because I'm a, a bit of an overthinker, so I think I get the, the thoughts going without having to write them down. Um, and that's great. And then one thing Epictetus does is he, he, is he recommends a couple things. If you identify something, let's say you're quick to anger, um, it says one, you should dedicate your training disproportionately towards where you're weak. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're the kind of person that gets angry, it's like, it's, it's not rocket science, but you should identify that that is the thing you should be working on and not avoid it or not work on or delay the progress. And the other thing he, he um, recommends is at least at the start to, which I think is kind of interesting because it's about making use of our environment. He recommends trying to avoid situations that entrench or further develop this bad habit. Mm, okay. So if you're quick, if you're quick to anger, 
spend less time around the kinds of people and situations that cause you to get in this position. And I find this is kind of, I think, comes off from this idea of control. If people say, well, my anger's in my control, and then they let themselves kind of stay in the same environment. They say, well, if I fail, it's my fault because I should have control over this. Epictetus actually recommends the opposite, which is, you know, if you're the kind of person that does, does something they don't want to do, like remove yourself from the kind of things that cause these situations, calm down, study, study, journal, work on these things, and then reintroduce these things to your life slowly. Because this is this, is this idea that um, Epictetus is allowing to introduce and is in other Stoics as well, but this idea of habituation of, of, of bad character traits and um, dispositions of like, I, I, I'm quick to get angry, or I'm quick to be jealous, um, or I'm quick to get anxious. And these things get worse the more we do them. Mm-hmm. So we recognize that I, I should be trying to minimize the amount of times this happens. And then once I'm kind of in a strong point, then reintroduce the things that used to upset me and, and be like, wow, okay, I'm, I'm better at this now. But don't just throw yourself against it when you're just starting. <laughs> I think that's a mistake. Slamming your head against the wall is not the, the proper yeah. technique. Right? Because not only is it ineffective, but Epictetus is going to argue it's actually going to make you worse. Right? If you're a... Um, and that's that we, we know that in contemporary psychology, right? It's about um, it's kind of exposure therapy, which is within your comfort zone, right? It's no help exposing yourself to the things that um, upset you or like inflame your emotions and your passions if they're taking control of you. Mm-hmm. It's in a, a small enough dose that you can handle it. Great. Now, when we talk about so, so we know that the things that are uh, that we're capable of cultivating, that are our responsibility to cultivate. <laughs> mm-hmm. That doesn't mean we we can instantly achieve them, but they are something we can work on. How do we approach the, that other category of control, the things we have some influence on? How do we approach that from a proper Stoic perspective? I always think of the Stoic archer example. Um, what's the what's the approach to that and how can, how might we approach it the wrong way and how what's the correct way to approach situations like that yeah so the situation is um you know epictetus says once we've got control over ourselves in terms of like what's up to us we don't want to just be unfeeling like a statue we want to have we want to maintain proper relationships with our friends our families you know our our city or government whatever mm-hmm. our job and in this case. So these things are important um, to the Stoics. So you raised the Archer example, and I think that's a great one. And it's, it's, it's one that I really agree with, um, which is this idea that the Archer aims at a target, um, but their true goal is to, is to aim well, right? So once you let go of that arrow, you know, uh, a pigeon flies in front of it, the wind pushes it away. Your job is to calculate and take into account all of these things as well as possible. And then, um, you know, try to be, um, maintain equanimity if it doesn't hit that target. Um, that doesn't prevent you from aiming. It doesn't prevent you from att- attempting to aim well. Um, Epictetus talks about this as like kind of reserve clause. You mm-hmm. know, I will do X, you know, God willing, like if it's, if it's faded for me. And by having that kind of reserve clause in place, you remember that you, you, you don't, it's not up to you whether or not this, this outcome occurs. Um, yeah, so I want to try to maybe analogize that or something, but the idea is what really matters in life or what, what, what we should focus our, on the most is what is up to us. We, we care about other things, mm-hmm. but we recognize that now that they've extended beyond that domain of being what, to, uh, what is up to us, um, we we don't have the ability to determine them. And to treat them like they're things that we determine is to misunderstand what they are. And to misunderstand what they are is to, is to make a mistake. So that to me makes sense. This picture of like, you know, always treat a thing like it is. So if you're engaging with uh, another person, always treat them like another person who has a separate thoughts, separate history, separate beliefs, and that person, things might go well, you might have a, a good friendship or relationship or things might go poorly, but it's not up to you um, how they, they feel and are disposed towards you. Um, I think that helps. That for me at least is, is, is a really good framework of it is remembering what type of thing it is. 
um, and that it's not a thing that you determine. And I think it gets harder for like for me as a as a parent uh, mm -hmm. to understand how do you apply this because you don't if you're trying to talk to somebody about Epictetus or Stoicism and, and you're not sure how to put it all together you know you you don't want to say well my son is nothing to me because that's not <laughs> that's not what he says but it it, it can re it can feel that way or read that way if if you're not sure how to put these different layers of philosophy together in the right way. So what is it that is nothing to me? And, uh, you know, the thing, you know, say to yourself, it is nothing to me. What is like my, my, my son, like my son's behavior is something that I cannot control as it were. Uh, mm -hmm. I might have some influence on, but let's say I'm embarrassed of something he does in a restaurant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I could say, well, it, like that's nothing to me or is, is my son, the noun, nothing to me, you know, what is <laughs> nothing to me? You know, what, what is the Epictetus approach here? So um, I can't remember the exact passage, but I think the way off the top of my head that I would, I would interpret that there's a claim about value, right? Like it's nothing to me. So it has no value and we want to avoid that. I think it's helpful if we emphasize the me. So it is nothing to me. And again, I don't know the exact passage, but a way that right. I go by thinking about this is it, is it is not a part of me, right? So your son's behavior in a restaurant, as hard as that can be to make that attachment, is not a part of you. It is not a direct result of you. Obviously, you have some sort of some sort of influence of that, strong influence, but it's a combination of other things um, about, you know, the, the most important part being the character of your, uh, not the character, but, you know, your, your child as a, as a individual person separate from you who has mm -hmm. impulses and desires and interests. And maybe the interest is to um, color, get up or scream or cry at that particular inopportune time. Um, and that behavior is not a part of you. It's not, it's not you. Um, it, it matters in so much as you care for and want to, um, love and help this person, but it is not, it is not you. What you are is, um, your responses, your behavior, your way of helping that problem or, or causing that problem to become worse. And I, so I think moving away from the nothing like, oh, my loved ones don't matter to, um, my loved ones are not, are not me, their behavior, their feelings about me, are not representative of who I am. The representative of you know their their person. Okay, okay, yeah. It's just uh, just uh, uh, sometimes you read it and you're like, this could be interpreted uh -huh. probably the wrong way as a very harsh thing, or it could there's probably more nuance here than than I'm picking up from a, a single paragraph. So. Do you have the passage of Epictetus in mind? I don't want to nerd out too much, but I just you don't. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me let me look here. Um, I I, uh, I that just came to me off the top of my head. So, because um, I know he has that brutal passage where he says that you know, kiss your child on the forehead at night and say you two will die when you tuck them into bed, and that's always like everyone's always like whoa, um, but that one is you know that one is about understanding what the thing you love is or the person you love is and understanding the person you love is, is a is a mortal thing um, yeah 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 it, and i think uh i mean it, it apply, we're just as mortal as people were then but back then mm -hmm. the odds of your of your of your children passing away during your lifetime were greatly enhanced and i'm sure that uh, that's uh, <laughs> something you may that's well a great point. I, never, I never thought of that I just the, the number of parents who, who had their children die was just substantially higher. This is the end of 316, Epictetus. How do I deal with these impressions that present themselves to me in accordance with nature or contrary to it? How shall I respond to them? As I should or as I shouldn't? Do I declare to those things that lie outside the sphere of choice that they mean nothing to me? For if you have yet to achieve that frame of mind, flee from layman if you ever want to begin to be somebody. So flee from layman. So the idea is that if you're not, if you're not, correctly distanced from externals yet and you submerge yourself in that world um it's just gonna it's just gonna destroy your character because you're gonna be too attached um 
I mean, I, I again, I, I'm I'm sticking with that reading, but I'll go back over it about this being because Epictetus clearly says that these things matter. We have a we have an an important way of um, respecting our relationship to them, and we do something wrong if we don't fulfill our role um, as a parent, as a father, as a um, member of a, of a city. Um, but I think I think that there's there's nothing to you in the fact that. Um, they are not a part of you. They're not, they're not indicative of you. And them going better or worse doesn't make you a better or worse person. Right? So there's this, I can have this conception of external things where like if I if I'm poor, if I lost my job, that means I'm like a, a worthless person. I've just become worse. If if everybody hates me, I've just become a worse person. Um, there's a way of looking at these things as being something that changes the quality of, of who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, Epictetus is going to think that we should, we should, you know, obviously love and have proper relationships with people, but they don't change the quality, our quality. Um, external situations don't change who we are. So it's, it's, uh, you know, like you said, when you read it one way, it can sound like, well, you are, you are not me. So you are nothing to me, but it's, it's mm -hmm. more, it's more nuanced than that. <laughs> I would like to say, I would hope so. <laughs> I would hope so as well. But I just know how sometimes uh, it, it can seem when you're, when you're, uh, especially if you're reading for the first time, like you said, that, Mm -hmm. that passage about kiss your child, someone might say, boy, that's cold, but, <laughs> but there's, is it, it, it's a philosophical text we have to mm -hmm. uh, to keep that in mind it's it's um it, the, you know like i said the way i interpret it is um first of all it's true even if it doesn't feel good mm -hmm. <laughs> and second of all at that time the odds of your child not making it through the night are probably greatly elevated from where uh, the, the 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 amazing world we live in today so mm -hmm. but uh but yeah i appreciate this that article about the the um i don't know what the, the i don't the the dichotomy of influence i don't know there's we get we need a catchy we need something catchy now yeah it, it is super catchy and that's why it's stuck and it stayed and I, I was trying to even find the first person that translated it as that um it's helpful um it, it is helpful to have something catchy in that in that first level and we're lacking that um I'm thinking more about this passage we just talked about, about things being nothing to us. And I, I, I just want to come back to it one more time. Sure, go ahead. Because um, it, it can be a rough idea if we start with things like my child. Right. Like the ultimate level of understanding, right, hopefully would be you to have a correct level of attachment to your child without being overly attached. That's like the highest, that's like the sage level, right? But we, even if we think of something like like your body, right? So you think, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, let's say you become, um, you have some sort of accident or you lose something or you lose a hand. It's not appropriate to like mutilate your hand when you're healthy or like hurt your body unnecessarily. But this kind of idea of like, my body has just been harmed. Is that something to me? Like, have I become a worse person? Have I become worse because I've, I've developed, uh, you know, some sort of disability or something? And it's very empowering to be like, no. You know, that is not that is not indica indicative of who you are, mm -hmm. this thing that's external to you. That's just that's just your body. But who you are is that character and that choice um, that I think makes more sense because we're we're bracketing for a moment the really emotionally sticky questions of family. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a statement like that is not at all difficult. So I was just rest. I was pulling that one yeah. out of my head and I just wanted to. Well, that's the joy yeah. of of. Uh of talking to someone who thinks deeply about these things it's <laughs> you know there are no canned answers when it comes to 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 philosophy you're applying ideas to new situations all the time right and mm -hmm. and and wrestling with them uh uh as it were like which what's how does this apply to this new situation and um and it's it's great to see that live on the podcast as well like wait a minute let's talk about that some more and yeah, i appreciate that well, that's great so what's uh so uh you're you're um I, I wanted to ask we we talked briefly before the show but i was going to ask on the show so you're working on this thesis you're reading these sources and you're doing it in the original greek is that correct mm -hmm. so 
most of the time, the way the way the process works is I'll read it and I'll be like, so I've so I've done about um, the equivalent of five years of, of coursework in Greek now, and wow. I'll read it in English and I'll be like, that's interesting, like what's going on here, and then I'll go to the Greek. It's not quite Greek's pretty hard. It's not quite the point where I can pull it open and, and read it just, like a normal book. Light your pipe uh, and go. Oh yes, I see. What yeah, this is. <laughs> I want to be that way, and it's a little bit easier with Epictetus because. Um, I've read it in English so many times. So when you go to the Greek, you know what's happening. Uh -huh. um, but that's crucial, right? Because um, even, even in a lot of the work that I do as like a scholar is, you know, let's say Epictetus uses a certain word. The translator who's not being, because the translator has to translate the entire book, right? They're right. not being as careful. They might translate that word a different way a couple of times. But then if you go to the Greek, you realize, no, he, he's talking about the same thing in different passages, right? And then all of a sudden that helps and you get, you get this new connection, this new idea that you couldn't if you were using the translation, right? Things like that um, are really fun and, and, and helpful. Um, and then another thing like the project I just did here, it was just something that most people don't have, which is most people are just reading English. They see control and they run with it. But when you go to the Greek, the, the word control just isn't there. Right, so you know it's communicating so it's something. Like, oh, this is a, a this is a translation issue more than uh, what's written in the original text. It's it's just it's already being run through a filter, right? And you know it's just the name of the game that that's just going to happen. But um, you know, not everyone has the time or the luxury to to learn Greek or the interest even, but just an awareness that it's, it's already being run through the filter of somebody else. And that filter, if you pull out three or four different translations, is sometimes quite a heavy one. Right? Mm -hmm. There's sometimes quite a bit of difference. I know that, and I noticed that most of Marcus Aurelius, um, the difference between those translations. Um, yeah, so, so that's the way the project works. I kind of read some Epictetus. I think that's interesting. I pull it up and dig into it in the Greek and see if I can find something um, different or interesting or new from what other people have said. So, so it applied in this case, have, have there been times when you've had a aha moment and, and s your understanding changed because you went to the Greek? Obviously this had, this particular discussion was influenced by that, but, uh, or, or the English translations usually ballpark enough where, where, where the Greek gives you maybe a little clearer picture, but, but not like, a, oh, that's what he meant. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I have to. Hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of points for that. Um, off the top of my head, it's nothing's coming. Maybe if something, if something comes up. Um, hmm. It's just, it's just interesting to, you know, people do this, have been doing this with uh, uh, the Bible for a long time, you know, trying yes, to read exactly. it in the origin and say, oh, I get more out of it and I see things from a different perspective, having this, uh, this ability, but I'm sure, I'm sure that, uh, that uh, being able to go to that Greek uh, and saying, well, what if this word actually translates as this instead, <laughs> or, or this word has two meanings and they went with this one. What if it's this one? Yeah. <laughs> Let me think of it like off the top of my head. I'm sure I could think about it more if, if I had a bit more time. No. Yeah. Um, one thing that Epictetus is really interested in is preconceptions. Um, so a preconception, I'm not sure if you've talked about this before, but a preconception basically is this innate understanding of the value of certain, um, I don't know, certain concepts, certain kinds of categories. Okay. So we understand that everybody shares the preconception of good and bad. We all know that we want good things, we pursue good things, we all know that we want to avoid bad things and that they're harmful. And then Epictetus says, um, you know, what an education is then is preconceptions are great, but what education is, is categorizing things into these preconceptions properly. So it's not, it's not other people out here like, oh, I hate good things. Nobody says that. They just think, <laughs> oh, it's good to steal. It's good to get what you want, even if it means hurting other people. They're just, they, it's a categorization mistake. Um, I don't know. And then one thing with the Greek that was fun for me is like, so... Uh, preconception is, is prolepsis and pro is before and lepsis is, is, is grasp. So it's like our grasp before we've thought about it. It's like ah. a free grasp of the idea. And then 
when we've firmly assented to something, when we understand something to be true, it's a catalepsis. And kata, so it's, it's instead of a prolepsis, it's catalepsis. So it's a grasp, well, kata is like through, thorough, right? So it's like we, we've, we've grasped through the idea. Hmm. Um, and it's these same kind of ideas and these combinations of different words. And you think, oh, well, like, I don't think of like firm assent as being the same thing as preconception, but we're working with the same Greek here. One is just a pre-grasp and then the other is like a thorough grasp of an idea. That kind of reminds me of the what they talk about Zeno using hand signals where it, it, knowledge yeah. and and yeah, and wisdom or however, whatever it was, uh, where you really grasp it uh, thoroughly uh, when you're like at the sage level or, or whatever. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It is, it is, it is exactly that. It's catalepsis is, is that thorough grasp. Um, and then... I'm trying to think of other things, but just but just things like little things like this that connect ideas in an interesting way, right? Like yeah. prohiresis, like Epictetus talks all the time about prohiresis. And it's like, what the heck is that? You know, your faculty of choice, what does that even mean? But um hyris, hyro is just is just to choose. So the pro hyro is just the it's the pre-choice, it's the things you do before you make a decision. Hmm. Um and just little insights like this really help the concepts I'll give a little clarity to yeah to, to the meaning of these things yeah that's great i'm nerding out on this but i think it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah well well you can work out if nothing else for all of us who don't have uh, the time or the inclination to learn greek we need like a stoic thesaurus or something yeah <laughs> and then yeah it's really cool and then when other people are talking about these things you know different authors are using the same greek word they're talking about the same thing but somebody who doesn't two different people translated Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca and Cicero. So now they're talking about the same technical word, but it might've been translated in different ways. And again, yeah, that's just, that's cool. It's connecting those dots and those pieces. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, Michael, is there anything else you want to uh, mention before we call it a day? Is there any upcoming things we should look for or, or anything you want to mention? Um, I don't really have anything to plug on, on, on my end or anything. Um, I just really appreciate the time. And um, if you're interested in anything more, I have a website where I have more of my talks on. You can come see those or other podcasts that I do and some a couple of blog posts about ideas. Um, I just think that if you're progressing through, sto like if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably already, you know, Stosin is a bit of a hobby. Um, it's a bit of a thing you enjoy doing. Um, and I just encourage this, um, what I try to do with the blog post, but if something seems weird, don't be afraid to question it and like, try to figure it out deeper. Um, because while the Stoics were not necessarily right about everything, it was, um, these things were thoroughly thought about. So if something seems immediately wrong, um, there might be something more to it. And, and, and I think that process of digging into it can be really rewarding. That's great advice. Uh, thank you, Michael, and uh, look forward to talking with you soon. Good luck on that defense. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Carpe diem. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of The Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. <laughs>